We're glad that you've joined us for worship t- today. Our call to worship is taken from Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4, and it reads like this. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. An everlasting rock, not just a a small rock, a small stone, but one that is continuous and is always present, always there for us. He is one who can be trusted in, and we invite you to trust more in him as you worship with us today virtually. Please now join me with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our most great and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we can worship you. We thank you for your strength, for your power, for your faithfulness, for your consistency, and that you are our everlasting and eternal rock. We pray that you would help us in our trust for you as we worship you this day. We pray that you would also cleanse us from our sin from this past week, from the things that we should have done that we have left undone for the things that uh, we did that we should not have done we pray that you would take these sins from us cleanse us renew us and help us to worship you now in spirit and in truth we pray this today in christ's name amen Our scripture for today is taken from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. 
reading from the English Standard Version. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Someone defined faith as trust, plain and simple. Story about Oliver Cromwell, who was the leader in England in the middle 1600s. He led the English Civil War against King Charles I. And as Cromwell had much business to do in governing England at the time, he sent one of his secretaries to the continent to conduct some business. And as was the custom at that time, a slave or a servant was assigned to the secretary to see after his needs. Well, that night when the secretary laid down to rest, he had a hard time falling asleep. And so the servant who was checking on the secretary said, Sir, why can't you sleep? Is there something the matter? And the secretary said, I'm so afraid that something will go wrong with the envoy. And the valet said, the servant said, Master, may I ask a question or two? And the secretary said, well, of course. He asked him, did God rule the world before we were born? And the secretary said, well, most assuredly he did. Well, will he rule it after we are dead? And the secretary responded, certainly he will. Then, Master, why not let him rule in the present as well? And then the secretary's faith was stirred, peace was a result, and in a few minutes both the secretary and the servant were sleeping soundly. You see, the servant had a good handle on faith. Maybe he recalled the words of Proverbs 3, verse 5, which has been a life verse for many a Christian. In fact, I have heard it quoted many times from this pulpit as graduating high school seniors explain their life verse. And Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 is a favorite. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Now, to obtain a larger appreciation for these words, we must look at it in its context. The book of Proverbs is a book of lessons by several authors over many years, and it's part of what is known as the wisdom literature in the Bible. It contains many admonitions. And Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 8, is within a, a section that encourages piety. Now, as we see these admonitions flow, you'll also notice that the same idea is repeated several times and in various ways. And so there's a general principle that runs through it as it gives a statement and then repercussions from that statement. And so in an effort to drive home the point, we see the same thing stated many different ways throughout the book. What do these words tell us? Well, there are three or four verbs listed here in these few verses. We are to trust, we are to acknowledge God, we are to fear the Lord, and we're to turn away from evil. And in all of these mandates or commands, we see that it's against human nature to be told what to do. We like to discover things on our own. But it's a good mark of the Christian that we submit to the Lord's instruction and that we understand that He has our best interest in mind. When we're seeking wisdom or knowledge, we might consult someone who has greater experience than we do, or someone that knows the field better than we do. Well, 
the Lord lends himself to our own development and knowledge and maturity by giving us knowledge in the book of Proverbs that far exceeds our own experience. And then there's the meaning of the word trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust here is the Hebrew term batak, which means reliance upon God. And that's what faith is, reliance upon God. John Calvin was arguably one of the best Bible teachers in the history of the church. And this is how he defined faith. He said, We must not think that Christian faith is pure and simple knowledge of God or an understanding of Scripture which flutters about in the brain without touching the heart. That is, the opinion we normally hold of things which are validated for us by some reason which sounds provable. Christian faith is, rather, a firm and solid reassurance of the heart by which we cling securely to the mercy of God which is promised to us through the gospel. You see, Calvin would go on to state that it's also a product of the spirit that enlightens the heart and the mind. And so the Christian faith goes much deeper than just a mere head knowledge of who God is, but it grips the heart and it affects the life. And notice that this faith is in contrast to relying on one's own understanding. In other words, there's a difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. You see, worldly wisdom is selfish in nature. It contains self and looking out for number one and doing what is right in your own eyes. It has a selfishness attached to it that gives no consideration for sin or offending God or offending or hurting others. The days of the judges in the Old Testament were much like this. We're told in Judges chapter 17, verse 6, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Proverbs testifies that this way of life is unproductive and self-destructive. Proverbs 14.12 tells us, There is a way that seems right unto man, but in the end leads to death. And the problem with many folks in today's world is that they simply do not want to listen to God. They give no respect to His Word found in the Scriptures. They care not that God has established Himself as the ruler of all, as Pastor Julian preached last week. And that every word that proceeds out of God's mouth is there for us to live by and be protected by. One preacher once said that the Ten Commandments can be summed up in the three words, don't hurt yourself. Augustine, the, church, the fourth century church father, said that the scriptures are God's love letter to you and me. And so understanding must have biblical trust run through it if it's redeemed and Christian. It's not as if God does not want you to learn, use your brain and your education that you've been given, but everything must be in subjection to Him, or it's a form of idolatry. If you and I are not trusting God in everything, then it means that we're trusting something else or someone else, whether it be yourself or another person, and that can qualify as one of the world's many, many idols. And so let me share with you some practical steps that come from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I believe that when the Scripture says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will keep your path straight, that I believe that this Scripture teaches that we are to pray about everything. We're to include God in every decision that we're to make, and that we are constantly in communion with Him. I attended an online business meeting once uh, with the denomination that I'm a part of, the Conservative Congregational Christian Conference, and I was surprised at how oftentimes we paused for prayer and asked God for God's guidance in what we were deciding. And I think that that's a good rule of faith for the Christian, that we keep a constant conversation with God and we're inviting Him 
to guide us and lead us along the way. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We ought to pray about everything. Secondly, we ought to seek a comprehensive understanding of the Lord through His Word. We ought to immerse ourselves in Bible reading because God wants us to know His will and to obey His will. We sing a hymn, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And then lastly, we ought to carry Christ into every decision that we make. Every circumstance that we encounter to where we wonder which way should we go, we ought to have the mind of Christ. And so these are some practical guidelines as we live out Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 and 7 and 8. The point being is that our minds must be renewed if we're to live transformed lives. Our minds must be renewed if we're to live transformed lives. Romans 12, 2. Two great examples of faith lived out in the here and now are two professional athletes. The first is a man by the name of Sam Coonrod. Sam is a pitcher for the San Francisco Giants. And on opening day, he was the only member of his team that chose to stand uh, during the national anthem. And when asked why he didn't kneel with the rest of the team, Sam Coonrod said that it was because of his Christian faith. He said, I can't kneel before anything besides God. Not only do we have the example of Sam Coonrod, but another gentleman that uh, exemplified faith in these troubling times is Jonathan Isaac. Now, Jonathan is only 22 years old, and he's a professional basketball player with the Orlando Magic. And he chose not to kneel during the national anthem, nor did he choose to wear the Black Lives Matter warm-up. And uh, even though he himself is African American. And this is what it was written of Jonathan Isaac. He indicated that his Christian faith aided in his decision not to kneel and that his faith was the key to healing the social in unrest of the nation. This is what he said For me, black lives are supported through the gospel, all lives are supported through the gospel. We all have things that we do wrong, and sometimes it gets to a place that we're pointing fingers at whose wrong is worse or whose wrong is seen. So I feel like the Bible tells us that we all fall short of God's glory. Well put, brother, well put. What Mr. Coonrod and Mr. Isaac show us is what Proverbs 9 verse 10 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is real understanding. They are good examples to us as we observe a world that's in turmoil, where loyalties are divided, and anger surges over the political unrest of our country, where love for God and love for neighbor is becoming rarer as time goes on, let us be reminded of where our allegiance should lie. Because what is the alternative? To trust in ourselves or to trust in luck or fate that the situation will simply work out? No, trust should be directed toward an individual and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we choose to trust Christ, we should not be surprised if there is backlash or pushback. Jesus said in his upper room discourse in John 15 verse 18, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Or as the Apostle John would write in 1 John 3 13, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. But we are to be God's people that put our trust in the Lord 
and we do not lean on our own understanding or the understanding of someone else. We submit ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and we put our trust in Him. In closing, the great Renaissance artist Michelangelo was known for his many works. Probably his two best works were his statue of David and the incredible ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. But what many don't know is that Michelangelo lived during the Reformation, and as it was sweeping Europe, he was influenced by Reformation ideas about justification by grace through faith. Michelangelo was plagued throughout his life to live up to his own high demands and the demands of others. And as he approached his death, a spiritual rebirth began to occur. One of his final works, intended to be his gravestone, was a statue of himself in the guise of Nicodemus, the one who was born again, as explained in John chapter 3. Nicodemus was holding the head uh, of the dead body of Jesus. And you can see that statue in the Duomo Museum in Florence, Italy, where a poem by Michelangelo is printed on the opposite wall. In the poem, Michelangelo describes coming to the end of his life and seeing that his artwork was actually harmful to his soul because it became his idol and his king. At the end of the day, his only hope was not being a great artist or receiving acclaim from others, but rather the divine love who to embrace us opened his arms from the cross and died. As we think about faith, we know that it is trust, plain and simple. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will keep your path straight. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Amen. Sometimes I fail, so your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, still I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond and
We now enter into a time of prayer. I'm going to mention a special prayer request as we uh, begin this time of prayer. This last week, a number of us have seen of the great explosion that took place in Beirut, Lebanon. As of uh, this uh, filming, uh, there are over 150 who have died suddenly in that great explosion of ammonium nitrate. We have um, indication that there were over 5,000 wounded, some 300,000 who are suddenly homeless, and the World Health Organization is now saying that uh, it is a humanitarian crisis. We've decided to give to this uh, collectively as a church. Uh, we invite you to uh, give uh, through the church and just designate if you're writing a check uh, that uh, on the memo line that it should go to Beirut and we'll be giving through Samaritan's Purses um, uh, outreach that has taken place in uh, Beirut. If you have further questions, certainly call us at the office. We'll be happy to tell you more. But now join me, please, in a word of prayer as we pray for Beirut, as well as uh, the current uh, situation in our nation, as well as our church. Let's pray together. Our most great and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you are our everlasting rock and that you are one that we can trust in. Oh Lord, please help us to look above more frequently than what we do. Help us to realize that you as our Heavenly Father are with us through your Holy Spirit and that you have not left us alone in a world that is so confusing and so out of control. Lord, please now take these, our prayers, that uh, we raise to you sincerely. And Lord, infuse them with your grace. And minister to this world and to this church, we pray. We bring before you the problems in Beirut this hour. Problems that are well beyond what we can imagine or think. We pray for grieving families. We pray that you will be with them. We pray for the city of Beirut that is now recovering from this horrendous explosion. Oh Lord, please uh, look after them. Please care for them. And please, Lord, help restore them. And as we think of the several hundred thousand that have been displaced, oh Lord, we pray that you would help them to find housing. And we pray that you would use uh, medical professional, professionals and others uh, who can care for uh, the wounded and grieving, Lord. We pray that you would use them to minister to this city. And we pray that it would not spiral out of control, but indeed that you would bring peace and order and health and uh, uh, concord there, we pray. Father, we think of other issues in our world today, and we once again bring before you the problems with the coronavirus. We think of the many who have died and the many who are infected. And we pray, Lord, for those who are now investigating a vaccine. And we think of several places, several companies, as well as countries that are now talking about a vaccine coming forward shortly. We pray for wisdom for scientists. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would guide them to the right solutions. But we also pray, Lord, for wisdom as to when to administer a virus, uh, vi uh, administer a vaccine. We pray that it would not be done hastily. We pray that it would be done with care and concern for people. And that you would use these uh, vaccines to protect many from this virus and bring healing to our world. 
Turning now, Lord, from problems in our world, we pray for problems in this country. And as we think of problems of division, Lord, we pray that you would bring unity. We also pray, Lord, that uh, for us as a church and for the church worldwide, that you would help us to trust in you and to rest and find peace in you rather than striving and arguing one with another. Please, Lord, look after us. We pray for the children, Lord, that are growing up in this time. We think again of uh, our college students, some returning to college, some not. We think of youth, some returning to school, some not, or some returning in some hybrid situation. We pray that you would keep them safe and that you would keep their teachers safe and that you would allow education to continue but to be done in a safe and helpful manner. Turning now, Lord, from our nation, we pray now for our church, and we think of those who are struggling with health issues. And we think of several this week uh, undergoing surgery, and we pray that you would bless them, protect them, and give them healing. Oh, Lord, be their great surgeon and be their great health giver, we pray. And we also pray for those who are mourning as a result of loss of a loved one. Father, will you please come and look after and care for these uh, families and um, friends who are missing a loved one this hour. Lord, minister to them greatly with your grace. And finally, we take a moment to bring before you in our mind's eye a church member that we haven't seen in a little bit, likely because uh, we've been locked down. Lord, we pray that as... Uh, that you would bless this one and that you would take care of someone we haven't seen. Bless them deeply and richly in their souls and strengthen them in their inner person, we pray. Father, we choose to trust in you today. You are the one that uh, can be relied on. You are our rock. You are our deliverer. And we now end our prayer trusting that you have heard these are prayers and concluding by taking upon our lips the prayer that you taught us as your disciples to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our benediction for today is taken from the epistle of Jude, verse 24. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence, the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.